Welcome to Chapter 8 in Trigonometry. Uh, this is Professor Bailey at Dallas College, and we're going to be looking at specifically 8.1 complex numbers in this lecture. Here we're going to look at basic concepts of complex numbers. Why do we even have them? What they are? Um, and then we're going to look at a couple different solutions for quadratic equations. We're going to look at math operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division for complex numbers. And then finally, we're going to look at powers of i. Specifically, you never have an exponent on i, and so we're going to look at how you reduce these. Uh, if there is an exponent on i, how you reduce it to get rid of the exponent. So complex numbers were um, created... Uh, specifically for solving radicals or square roots or even roots of negative numbers. And before we had um, that these were just had no solution. And um, mathematicians realized that if we could try to figure out a different way of solving these, it may solve some practical problems. And so we start with this first um, definition of what an imaginary unit i actually equals. And so the value of i, the imaginary unit, is the square root of negative 1. So since whenever we square a square root, the square root of negative 1 times itself, or the square root of negative 1 squared, is simply what's inside the radical. So i squared in this case simply equals negative 1. These are very basic building blocks for complex numbers, and you need to know this basic definition that i is equal to the square root of negative 1. And by definition of square roots, if we square both sides, we're going to get i squared equals negative 1. Now the complex number is made up of a real part and an imaginary part. So imagine that a and b are real numbers then any number of the form a plus b i, or a plus b times i, is a complex number. In the complex number a plus b i, a is the real part, so it's just a number, and b is the imaginary part. So you might have something like 3 plus 2i, 4 minus 5i, etc. <clears throat> the first thing is that two complex numbers are equal if and only if the real part, in this case a and c, are equal, and if the imaginary part, or the imaginary coefficients, are, are also equal, in this case b equals d. Notice if a equals 0 and b cannot be equal to 0, the complex number is a pure imaginary number. So in this case we'd have 0 plus 3i, or just 3i. By the same case, if a is not equal to 0 and b is not equal to 0, then we have a non-real complex number, 7 plus 2i. Notice the difference here. When the real part is um, 0, then we simply have what's called a pure imaginary number. But if both of the numbers are non-zero, a and b, then we have a non-real complex number. We can also have just a real number where the b equals 0. So for example, if you wanted to express the number 4 as a complex number, that would be 4 plus 0i, which is just a pure real number. When you write the number a plus bi, or a plus ib, this is called um, standard form for complex numbers. This is just a, um, a look at all of the numbers. Um, and how they're classified. Up until now, we haven't had this blue section, which is um, non-real complex numbers. We've only had the side um, that's on the left, which is kind of in this, um, I don't know, pinkish, peachish color. <clears throat> so if we start on the very inside, we have natural numbers. These are our integers, one, two, three, four. Um, you might think of them as counting numbers, etc. If we add 0 to all the natural numbers, then we have this set of whole numbers, which includes 0 plus all the natural numbers. If we add negative um, natural numbers to this, negative 1, negative 2, etc., then we have all of the integers. So integers are all the negative numbers, negative, ne excuse me, negative natural numbers 
plus zero plus all the positive natural numbers. And then last we have rational numbers, which also includes all the numbers we've been talking about, but rational numbers are numbers that can be um, described as um, fractions, can be written as fractions or decimals that do not repeat, um, excuse me, that do repeat or that stop. Irrational numbers are numbers when we take the square root of, we'd have a decimal number that would continue on. Um, for example, pi, we know that's 3.14 and then it just continues on non-repeating, okay? Um, the square root of 2 is like that. Um, typically, we write irrational numbers um, specifically, like if it's the square root of 2, we do not write 1 point, um, what would that be? Um, 1.7, blah, 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 okay? And then, of course, all of these are real numbers, and they can be written in the form a plus bi, but only when b is equal to 0. On the right, we have all the complex numbers. This is where a is not... Um, excuse me, b is not equal to zero, um, and um, we can have pure imaginary numbers. Here is where we just have an i component because a is equal to zero, and then when a is not equal to zero, a can be positive or negative, and any real number. <clears throat> so let's look at how we use this to solve. If a is greater than zero, then the square root of any negative a or the opposite of a is simply equal to i times the square root of the positive value of a okay so when we're taking the square root of a negative number we can remove the negative outside of the radicand uh, out from underneath the symbol by replacing it with an i because remember that i equals the square root of negative one so we can remove that from the radical so let's look at how this works with some specific problems. So the first thing we're going to do in, in um, problem A is we have the square root of negative 16. So this is i times the square root of 16. Well, the square root of 16 is 4, so we have simply 4i as the result for the square root of negative 16. In B, we're going to do the same thing, the square root of negative 70 is i times the square root of 70. Um, we could try to reduce this down, but we get 2 times 35 and 5 times 7, and there aren't any factors that appear um, that are perfect squares. So this is really in simplest form. In C, we have i times the square root of 48, again, removing the negative to the, from the radical. But here we have... Um, 48 is the square root of 16 times 3. And here we can see the square root of 16 is 4, so we can pull a 4 on the outside. Because remember, we can make this the i times the square root of 16 times the square root of 3 and solve each individually. And so we get the final answer is 4i times the square root of 3. So when we were trying to solve these equations, when we have a square, for example, x squared equals negative 9, then the way we do that is we take the square root of both sides. Remember that when we're starting with a square term, we have to consider the positive and negative square roots. Um, so the square root, x equals the plus or minus the square root of negative 9, and then we solve for this, again, pulling out the i and then square root of 9 is 3. So in A, we get the possible values of x are plus 3i or minus 3i, positive or negative 3i, okay? We do the same thing in B. First, we're going to set x squared equal to negative 24. We're going to take the positive and negative square roots of both sides. We're going to pull out the i so that we're now taking a square root of just positive 24. And then we're going to look for the factors of 24 that occur at least twice. And here we have um, 2 times 12 and um, 2 times 6. Uh, so we get 4 times 6, and 4 is a perfect square root. So we get plus or minus i times the square root of 4 times the square root of 6. And we can take the square root of 4, which is just 2, and pull that on the outside. And so this is our final answer, plus or minus 2i square root of 6. It's a good idea to put um, 
the I multiples in front of the radical sign because it gets a little confusing sometimes, especially in handwriting, um, whether you mean for the 2I to be included inside the radical or not, and, in, and it certainly should not be. So putting it in front of the radical, putting it in front of the square root symbol makes this very clear that 2I is not part of um, the radical. It's not inside uh, the radical symbol. <clears throat> so again, when working with negative radicands, we use the definition that the square root of negative a is equal to i times the square root of a. And we should do this always. We should always pull that i out, make the square root um, positive before we do use any other rules for radicals. Specifically, um, the rule when you have the square root of c times the square root of d, we can combine them under the same square root symbol, and we can do this in either direction. We can separate them or connect them. But this is only possible, this is only possible when both C and D are positive, when both C and D are not negative. They cannot be negative. This multiplication rule does not work on negative radicals, okay? For example, the square root of negative 4 times negative 9 equals the square root of positive 36, which equals 6. While if we separated them, we'd get the square root of negative 4 times the square root of negative 9. Well, this is i times the square root of 4, or 2i. The square root of negative 9 is i times the square root of 9, or 3i. If we multiplied these out, we'd get 6i squared, but remember, i squared equals negative 1. So we'd get negative 6. And this is not the same thing, okay? This is not the same thing. As you can see, when they're combined, we get a positive 6. When they are separated, we get a negative 6. So we cannot move back and forth with this multiplication rule unless both of the radicands are positive. So let's try some of these. Negative 7, square root of negative 7 times the square root of negative 7. This is i square root of 7 times i square root of 7. We get i squared times square root of 7 squared, which gives us um, negative 1 for i squared. And of course, square root of 7 squared is just 7, so we get negative 7. Here we get, an, in v, we get i times the square root of 6 and i times the square root of 10. If we multiply these out, we get i squared times um, the square root of 60. Again, we might look for, um, here we get 3 times 20, 20 is uh, 2 times 10, um, and 10 is 2 times 5. And so I can see there, uh, I have a multiple of 4 in there, which is i squared times the square root of 4 times 15. 4 is a perfect square, the square root of 4 is 2. So we get 2i squared times the square root of 15. This is just taking the square root of 4 separate. Since they're now both positive, we can separate them in their own radicals. And of course, i squared equals negative 1. So our final answer is negative 2 times the square root of 15. When we're doing division problems with negative radicals, we're going to do the same thing. In C, we're going to get i times the square root of 20 over i times the square root of 2. In the numerator, here we can, um, in the numerator, we have 2 times, or 4 times the square root of 5, and here we have the square root of 2. Hmm. I think it'd be easier to do, leave this as um, square root of 2 times the square root of 10, because then we can see that the square root of 2 times the square root of 10, the, the square root of 2's cancel out, the i's cancel out, and we're just left with the square root of 10. <clears throat> in, the denom in D, excuse me, in the numerator, we have i times the square root of 48. Well, 48 is um, 2 times 24. So we can change the numerator to the square root of 2 times the square root of 24 and cancel out the square root of 24 and just be left with i times the square root of 2. Okay, notice that all of our answers do not have a power on i. When, I, when it's i squared, 
remember that I squared equals negative 1, so we reduce that. And um, here we just have I, so that's fine too. So just remember, we never express the un imaginary unit I with an exponent on it, unless it's uh, an exponent of 1. <clears throat> when we have a um, quotient with a single real number in the denominator, what we need to do is to make this into two, two fractions, negative 8 over 4 plus the square root of negative 128 over 4 so that we can put the complex number in standard form so that there's an entirely real part plus or minus an entirely imaginary part. Okay. So they're going about this a little bit different. I would actually separate this out into two fractions from the very beginning, negative 8 over 4 um, plus um, negative square root of 128 over 4, but that's okay. Notice what they've done here is they've factored um, negative 128 into negative 64 times 2. Well, remember, we can take the negative out. In fact, we should have done that first. It should be i times the square root of 28. And then we get the square root of 62, 64 times 2. Well, the square root of 64, the square root of 64 is 8. And so we get negative 8 plus 8i um, times the square root of 2. Now we need to reduce these. We get negative 8 over 4 plus 8i square root of 2 over 4. And the way they did this a little bit differently too, they factored 4 out of the numerator so they can just cancel these two out. Okay. You would have got the same thing if you'd done the other way. Sorry about that. Negative 8 divided by 4 is negative 2, plus 8 over 4 is plus 2. Okay. When we're adding and subtracting real, excuse me, when we're adding and subtracting complex numbers, we simply add the real parts, a plus c, or subtract the real parts, a minus c, and then add the coefficients for the imaginary part, b plus d, or subtract the coefficients for the imaginary part if it's a subtraction problem, b minus d. So let's find these. These are pretty straightforward, pretty simple. It's easy to stack these, and they actually add and, and subtract just as if i was not i, but any other variable. Um, 3 minus 4x plus negative 2 plus 6x would be come out to the same um, answer, but using i as the variable instead of x. Okay, so here we're going to add the real parts, which is 3 plus negative 2. We're going to add the imaginary parts, which is negative 4 plus 6. And so we get negative 1 plus 2i. We're going to do the same in B. We're going to add the real parts, negative 4. Excuse me, this is a subtraction problem. Be careful here because it changes the sign. Negative 4 minus 6 and 3i minus a negative 7i becomes plus 7i. Okay. Negative 4 minus 6. Be careful here. We're going in the negative direction, so we're at negative 10. 3 minus a negative 7 is the same as 3 plus 10, so we get negative 10 plus 10i. Again, these are very straightforward. Add or subtract the real parts, and then add or subtract the um, coefficients on i. When we're multiplying complex numbers, this is the same as foiling, okay? I'm not going to use this formula. What you want to do is first digits, outside digits, a times di, inside digits, um, c times bi, and last digits, bi times di, okay? bi times di. Let's look at a problem, okay? 
Here we have um, 2 times 3 plus 2 times 4i minus 3i times 3 minus 3i times 4i. That's just doing FOIL, okay? First, 2 times 3, outside, 2 times 4i, inside, negative 3i times 3, and then last, negative 3i times positive 4i. We multiply each of these products out and then combine like terms. So we get 6 plus 8i minus 9i minus 12i squared. Remember that i squared is negative 1, so this becomes a positive 12. 8i minus 9i, and so we end up with 18 minus i. 18 minus i. Notice that all of these products will not be a quadratic or look like a quadratic because we're using the imaginary unit and we cannot have an exponent on the imaginary unit. I squared equals negative one, so we simplify that. We're gonna do the same thing here. Um, this is four plus three I times four plus three I. Do not square each term inside and think you've done. This is a FOIL problem. This is the same as four plus three I times another parenthesis of four plus three I. So do first, outside, inside, last or the FOIL technique. I'm not gonna go through this problem. You can see each of the steps here, multiplying the first, outside, inside, last. Here they just did a, the simplified formula, which is double the product of both terms. But if you do the FOIL, you'll get the same answer. Remembering again to convert I squared into negative one before you state your final answer. There can be no exponents on the imaginary unit. In the case of a sum and a difference, remember when we have a sum and a difference of binomials, this is equal to the square of the first term minus the square of the second term. We can do that same thing here. 6 squared minus 5i squared, and so we get 36 minus 25i squared. Again, i squared is negative 1, so we get 36 plus 25 or 61, okay? When we have sum and a difference of complex numbers, we always end up with a pure real number, um, or the fact that the i will be i squared, and which converts to negative one. <clears throat> Here we can see that you can use your TI-83 or 84 um, to do this multiplication, and this is how the answers are displayed for the last three problems we just did. Okay, so again, the, the product of a sum and a difference is the square of the first term, really, plus the square of the coefficient in front of i. Okay, when we have quotients, when we're dividing complex numbers, this is the most confusing and complex or complicated problem to solve. What we have to do is get rid of the complex number in the denominator. We want it just to be a real number. So we're going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by the complex conjugate of the denominator. What this means is if this is um, minus i, then we do the same complex number with plus i in here. If this was 5 plus i, then we would use 5 minus i. In this case, the complex conjugate of 5 minus i, all we're doing, if this was negative 5 minus i, it would still be negative 5 plus i. We never change the sign of the first number, the real number. We just change it from subtraction to addition or addition to subtraction to find the conjugates. Okay. Remember, when we multiply a sum and a difference, we have only a real number. And so that's what we're trying to do with these division problems is get rid of the complex or the imaginary unit in the denominator. So here we're going to have a FOIL up top and the denominator we're going to have a sum and a difference. Okay. When we multiply the FOIL out we get 15 plus 3i plus 10i plus 2i squared. Um, in the denominator we get 25 minus i squared. And so we get 13 um, plus 13i all divided by 26. Okay by substituting in i squared equals negative one in the numerator and in the denominator. Notice here that 13 times two is 26. So if we factor a 13 out of the numerator, um, we get 13 times one plus one i, 
we factor a 13 out of the denominator, we get 13 times 2. And so we can cancel that out and we get 1 half plus 1 half i. I think it'd been easier to see if we um, also factored 13 out of the denominator so that you can see in this step it was 13 times 2. But you get the idea. Okay. Even if we have just um, i in the denominator or 4i or whatever, all we do is, um, you know, this is the same as 3 over 0 plus i. So we're going to um, multiply the numerator and the denominator by um, 0 minus i or negative i. Okay. <clears throat> Again, we do this, we're multiplying the numerator and denominator, so we're not changing the value because any number or expression over itself equals 1. So we're multiplying the first expression by simply by one, just, and we did the same thing in the last problem. So notice in the denominator now we get negative i squared, and in the numerator we get negative 3i. Well, negative i squared is negative negative 1, which is positive 1, and so we get um, just simply negative 3i. Or if we wanted in standard form, we could rewrite it as 0 minus 3i. And again, we can see here um, how this would look if we actually did the division problem in our calculator and use the fraction conversion. Otherwise, it would be 0.5 plus 0.5i. Okay. What if we have a quadratic equation? 9x squared plus 5 equals 6x. Well, when we're solving quadratic equations, we set these equal to 0. And then we use the quadratic formula. This would mean, you know, in our problem, a is 9, b is negative 6, and c is 5. We plug all those values in. And we get down to a complex um, answer because we have a square root of a negative number. So here we're going to just take our steps. We're going to pull the i out in front. So this is 6 plus or minus i times the square root of 144. Well, the square root of 144 is a perf is a, 144 is a perfect square. Um, it is in fact 12 squared. So what we get in the numerator is 6 plus or minus 12i. Again, i times the square root of 144. The square root of 144 is 12. So we get 6 plus or minus 12i in the numerator over 18. Remember that our final answer needs to be expressed um, in two terms: a real term and a imaginary term. Okay, so we have to write this as two fractions, 6 over 18 plus or minus 12 over 18. I find it simpler to turn this into two fractions right now, 6 over 18 and 12 over 8, plus or minus 12 over 18, so that it's easier to simplify. They like to do it a little bit different. They like to simplify first. So notice that they factored a 6 out of the numerator, a 6 out of the denominator, and canceled them out. And now you can see we get 1 over 3 plus or minus two-thirds i, okay? You must rewrite complex numbers, complex quotients in fractional form with a fraction real number plus or minus a fractional um, imaginary part, not a, a complex number in the numerator and a real number in the denominator. So our last part of this lesson is looking at powers of i. And powers of i repeat every four um, iterations. So we get i to the power of 1 is simply i, like every number is. i squared is negative 1 times negative 1. Remember, i is equal to um, square root of negative 1. i squared is equal to negative 1. i cubed is i times i squared, so negative 1i or negative i. And then i to the fourth is i squared times i squared, or negative 1 times negative 1, which is positive 1. And then it all starts back over again. So we can use this kind of circular pattern that happens with every four digits to figure out what's happening when we have much larger exponents, like 73 or something. Okay. So what we can do here is rewrite each power into a power of 4, okay? So notice that i to the 15th is i to the 4th times i to the 4th times i to the 4th times i cubed, okay? Because i to the 4th 
is times i to the fourth times i to the fourth is i to the twelfth. We add all the exponents. Okay. Another way to do this, well, here, let's look at that. Okay. So i to the twelfth is i to the fourth cubed. So it's just going to be one times one times one. It doesn't matter as long as this is a multiple of four. And then we have to remember what i cubed is. This is i squared times i, which is negative i. And so we get negative i here, okay? Another way we can do this is simply divide the exponent by 4 and look for the remainder, okay? Well, 4 goes into 15 3 times. 3 times 4 is 12, and we get a 3 remainder. So this answer is equivalent to i cubed. Remember, this is 1. And i cubed is equal to i squared times i, which is equal to negative i. <clears throat> i to the negative 3 is 1 over i cubed. It's an interesting problem here. Um, so what they've done here is simply multiplied by i to the 4th, because that is a factor of 1, right? This is 1. So if we do that and add the exponents, we now get i, which is an easier way to do this than um, rewriting this as 1 over i cubed and then multiplying it um, by um, negative i cubed over negative i cubed, etc., and then figuring it out. All right? So this was, a, this was an easier way to do it by multiplying by... Um, if we have a negative exponent, um, multiplying it by 1, which is any, any multiple of 4 here. So if this was i to the negative 3, we could have multiplied it by i to the 12th, which would still be equal to 1. So we can figure out where it falls on the positive exponent.